Hi folks, and welcome to another episode of Open Analysis Live. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at Princess Locker 2, which is a ransomware variant. It's been around for a while, but there's a new version out and it's becoming a little bit more popular. But specifically what we're gonna focus on is the packer that's used to pack Princess Locker. So they've done something kind of interesting where they're not using process injection, they're actually using self-injection. So this is kind of an older packing technique and one that is usually taught as like a fundamental. But because there's so much process injection, we haven't really covered this technique on our channel yet so I wanted to sort of dive into it. So I think what we'll do first is we'll talk about the technique and later in the episode we also have a special guest who's going to be joining us to talk a little bit about some PE structures so stay tuned for that as well. So before we talk about Princess Locker let's talk about this packing technique because I think a little bit of background on this is going to help as we work through the sample. So if we look at this little diagram that I've drawn here I've kind of separated this out into a couple different steps. So what they're doing here is they're actually writing a PE into their own process memory and then just executing it. So let's look at the steps that they need to do in order to make this happen. So the first thing they do is they actually allocate some memory. And this is a good place for us to get a heads up about what's going on. So we can actually place a breakpoint on virtual alloc. And then every time virtual alloc is called, we can just take a look at the memory section that's allocated and see if stuff is written to it as the process continues to execute. So that's the first step is to allocate some memory. The next thing they do is write the PE file into that memory. Now, there's lots of different ways that they can move a PE file into that memory section. And it's not really worth our time to try and hook all the different ways to do it. There's just too many different ways and some of them can't even really be hooked. So what I like to do is I kind of ignore this step in terms of trying to track it. And I just move on to the next step, which is where they want to actually execute the code that they've written into the memory section. So if they have set up the memory section so that it's not executable, they'll need to call virtual protect in order to change the execution permissions on the section. And a lot of unpacking tutorials will tell you that that you can hook virtual protect. And then if you see execution being changed for a memory section, then you know, okay, probably it's gonna execute there. So that's kind of like a two-step approach to unpacking this type of malware. You hook virtual alloc, and then you hook virtual protect. And if you see something allocated, some PE stuff written to it, and then the execution permissions change, you know to dump that memory. Now, the thing is that doesn't always work because sometimes a section might be allocated as executable. And there's also some other tricks that they might use where they don't actually have to go through that API. So I also kind of don't trust this. What I do instead is I actually put a hardware breakpoint for execution on the entire page of memory that's been allocated. So that means if that memory is ever executed, the breakpoint will fire and I could say, okay, so this memory is actually being executed. Now it's time to dump. So in that case, that would be this last step here where they actually transfer execution to the PE file. So when EIP is pointing into the PE file in memory, we would trigger our breakpoint here and dump it out. And of course you can see at this point, the whole PE file file or all the code that's going to execute at least will be written into that memory segment so we can just dump it out. So this is sort of like the four steps that they would take in general to inject a PE file into their own memory and then execute it. And of course, when we want to unpack it, we are going to set a breakpoint on virtual alloc. Then we are going to set a execution breakpoint on the memory that's been allocated. And then if it's executed, we will dump it out this final step. So we're really only kind of looking at this first step and the final step. And of course, there's lots of different variations of this this packing technique. So there's lots of fancy stuff that they can do, but this is kind of an overview in a nutshell, just to see what's going on. Now, the other thing about the packer that Princess Locker is using, there's a second trick here. They're actually corrupting the PE header. So we can't actually recreate the PE file directly from the dump. We're gonna need to do some massaging. And when we get to that, I'll show you what it looks like. And we'll, I'll sort of take you through step-by-step step how to reconstruct the PE file, even though it's been corrupted. So with that, let's just take a quick look at what the process tree looks like for Princess Locker. So I have it pulled up in hybrid analysis here in the sandbox. And if we scroll down, here's our first tip off that this packer is not using any process injection. So in the process tree, there's only one process running. So this means that they must be injecting code into themselves. This must be self injection. I just wanted to show you guys this. So if you ever see this where there is no sub processes, but you know the sample is packed, this is the technique to use. That's sort of your tip off. All right, this is gonna be some self injection. I need to do some breakpoints on virtual alloc and see what's written in. So with that, let's pop over to our VM and we'll start unpacking. Okay, so the VM that I'm using here is a Windows 7 32-bit VM and all the tools that I'll be using I will link in the description of the video below as always and I'm running Process Explorer as administrator with a different name just in case they try and check for the string Process Explorer as a running process. So we see that running here. Now there is no process injection so this is going to be very interesting but I like to have it running just in case it's you know it's a good habit to have. So I've dropped the packed sample onto our desktop here 
here and called it plock and we will open it up in x64 debug which is x32 debug because it's a 32-bit operating system and start setting our breakpoints so we'll just drag this over okay so the first thing we want to do is set a breakpoint on virtual outlaw so i'm going to use Control g and i'm going to go to it by label so i'm going to type in the label virtual outlock now here's our first interesting thing. You'll notice that we're in kernel 32 DLL and we've gone to the virtual outlock function, but you'll notice that there isn't really any code here. There's just a jump and the jump goes up to another jump, which jumps into another DLL. So you might be wondering, well, why is there no actual code for virtual outlock in kernel 32? Well, if we follow this jump here, we'll see that we're now in kernel base.dll and we have a virtual alloc function in kernel base. So what's going on is as of Windows 7, Microsoft has moved some core APIs into something called kernel base.dll and virtual alloc is one of them. So even though you import kernel 32.dll and use the virtual alloc function there, it's really just a redirect to kernel base. And the reason why they've done this is because they're trying to make a minimum set of APIs that exist for Windows to run they call it MinWin. And there's some documentation I can link to this below. But really what you need to remember is that if you are going to set breakpoints on virtual alloc, the code for it is actually not in kernel 32, it's in kernel base. So now that we're in kernel base, what we're gonna do is we're gonna set a breakpoint on the return from virtual alloc, because of course, when it returns, it's going to have the base address of the memory section that's allocated. And I'll show you the MSDN documentation for virtual alloc so we can see what it's actually returning, where we're gonna find that base address. Because of course, with the base address, we can locate that memory section in our process. So I'm going to put a breakpoint on the return here and I'll pull up MSDN now. Okay, so here's virtual alloc. And the important thing here is the return value is the base address of the allocator region. So this is the address where the memory section starts that's been allocated. So if we recall the calling convention, the return address is going to be in the EAX register. So what that means is the base address of the newly allocated memory will be in the EAX register when we return from virtual alloc. So if we pop back to our VM, we can see that every time this breakpoint is hit, we'll just look at EAX and that'll give us the base address of the new memory segment that's been allocated. Now, all we have to do is run our process and start watching these breakpoints to see where the memory is allocated. So we run, and of course the first breakpoint is the entry point, and entry point is always set as a breakpoint in x64 debug, so we can just keep debugging uh, and not worry about it. So now we've hit our first breakpoint on virtual alloc, we've hit the return, and in EAX is the address of the newly allocated virtual memory section. So what we can do is just right click here and follow in dump and that's going to show us the memory section here that starts at that address. So now what we can do is as we're stepping through the code we can watch this memory section and see if anything happens here. Now we might get lucky and this first allocated memory section might actually contain the PE file but there's lots of reasons why you might want to allocate virtual memory in your program that don't relate to actually unpacking a sample. So what I like to do is I like to step forward a little bit and see if anything is actually written in here that might look like a PE file. So because we have a breakpoint on virtual Virtual alloc, I'm pretty confident that we'll probably hit virtual alloc a few times. So I don't need to actually single step through the code. I can just run until I hit the breakpoint again. This isn't always the case with APIs, just with virtual alloc because it's so common. So I'm pretty confident that we'll hit it again before we start executing. So let's run until the next time we hit the breakpoint. So we hit the breakpoint again, and this time we have the same base address in EAX. So it looks like they allocated more memory and that memory was allocated with the same base address. But for our purposes, we don't really care too much because we're already watching that base address, so we don't really have to do anything. We just keep debugging here. Okay, so now we've hit a uh, breakpoint again, and we can see that there's actually something written in here. Let's scroll down and see if we can notice anything interesting. And we definitely do. Okay, so you guys seen what I'm seeing? Text, R data, data, GFIDS, I'm not sure what that is, and resource. So this to me looks like a section table for a PE file. Now, it's kind of strange because above that section table, you would expect to see a PE header, but there is no PE header. It's just a bunch of garbage. So I'm pretty sure that they're writing a PE file into this memory. Now what I can do is I can set an execution breakpoint on this entire memory section. So first we can just jump to it in the memory map. So just right click follow in memory map and we can see here's our memory section here that's been allocated. So we can just do a right click memory breakpoint on execute and we'll just do a single shot because as soon as they execute we want to dump this program. So let's do a single shot execute. So now we don't really have to worry too much about our breakpoint on virtual alloc because we know as soon as 
they try and execute something in this memory section, we are going to break on that and then we can dump out that memory segment or at least take a look at it and see if there's a full PE file in there. So let's continue debugging. So we have another virtual alloc breakpoint, but I'm just going to continue because we have that execute breakpoint, so it doesn't really matter. And we hit another virtual alloc and another virtual alloc and another one and another one. Hey, now we have an execute breakpoint hit. So we can see down here, it's a memory breakpoint on execute and it's in our memory section here. So let's take a look at our memory section and see what was written into it. So we still have this sort of garbage up here. We have what looks like a section table. And then if we scroll down here, yeah, so it looks like they've written maybe some code in here. And it looks like there's like a imports table here. These look like imports. So there's probably a full PE file in this memory section. So at this point, we probably have a full PE in the memory section that we can dump out and take a look at. So step one of our unpacking is complete. So to dump it, we can just do our same trick here, follow in memory map, and then right click and dump to file. And we'll save it on the desktop here. Okay, so there's a couple things that we need to keep in mind about this memory that we dumped out. Number one, there's a full PE file in that memory segment. Number two, they're executing that PE file in the memory segment, which means that the PE file is mapped. So that's number two. This is a PE file and it's mapped. So we're gonna have to unmap it. And number three is it has a corrupted header. So before we can read it in any of our tools or open an IDA, we're gonna have to fix that header. So to fix the header, we need a little bit of theory about how PE files are constructed. So to help us explain how they're constructed, we've asked Karsten from Malware Analysis for Hedgehogs because he's working on a great series right now of YouTube videos on PE files and how they're loaded, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll link his channel below. But right now we're gonna jump to a quick explanation of what a PE header is and how it matches up with the rest of the PE. Thanks for your invitation, Sergey. Um, so the portable executable file format is uh, quite interesting. So it was introduced with Windows NT 3.1, I think that was in 1993 or so. And um, well, they basically wanted to support 32-bit architecture. So uh, Microsoft invented a new file format for executable files called the portable executable format and it's the um, successor for the new executable format. So um, these MS-DOS um, applications were in, in the new executable format and MS-DOS was still part of the Windows operating system so it was a command line part of them. Um, and they wanted to make sure if you execute the new file format in the MS-DOS, it should not crash, it should show a meaningful message. So they said, okay, the portable executable format must uh, be backwards compatible by uh, prepending a full MS-DOS application to them that prints a meaningful message, which is this program cannot run in DOS mode. So that's uh, kind of odd, I guess. So we have actually two executable formats in one format. So um, yeah, but let's take a look. So let's take a look into the PE header, specifically the portion that Sergey will be editing. Um, now the PE header, as I said, starts with the full MS-DOS application called uh, MS DOS stuff, which will just print out the message this program cannot run in DOS mode or this program must be run in Win32. And um, for the operating system to know that this is actually an MS DOS file, there are the magic bytes MZ and they are always at the start of an MS DOS executable. Now the operating system also has to know that this is a PE file and not just an MS-DOS application. So there are also magic bytes for the PE portion of the file, um, PE00. And um, they added a value to the headers of the MS-DOS step called ELFA new. And this value is the offset to the PE signature. So this way, if the value points to a valid signature, Operating system knows it's not an MS-DOS application, it's instead a portable executable file. And uh, with that offset, it also knows where the core file header starts and the other headers follow right after the core file header. So 
that's um, how the Windows loader knows. And uh, yeah, that's the portion that just prints this program can be run in DOS mode, right? Um, now there in is uh, an interesting part uh, between the MS DOS stop and the start of the PE signature. There can be some unused space, and um, early viruses actually used that unused space to write the code into that and this was also called a header infection so they had to be very small to fit into this space and there's more unused space in, in portable executable files which is most of the time due to file alignment um, so the sections of a file and the uh, are, are aligned to certain boundaries and also the um, sizes of the sections are rounded up to certain boundaries so um, often case there's unused space between the start of the first section and the end of the PE headers. So in this case, um, the PE headers also contain the optional header section table, the coffee header. So what does file alignment actually mean? Why are things aligned in, in this uh, file format uh, on disk? Um, why are the sections aligned? Why do the section sizes, why are they rounded up to certain boundaries? So the reason is that the operating system wants to read the file in chunks, um, in blocks of usually 512 bytes. And um, that's because, well, imagine you have to buy 10 items from the grocery store and instead of buying them all at once, you go 10 times to the same grocery store and buy 10 times the, uh, well, each item you need and uh, bring that 10 times to your, to your home. So uh, you can imagine that's not efficient, it's time consuming. Same would happen if the operating system has to read byte by byte. So instead of doing that, it says, okay, just align that to 512, I will read them and if there's some you know, unused um, stuff on that uh, in that area it doesn't matter. So in the end, it's more efficient to read always in these blocks. So let's talk about mapping and unmapping. Um, mapping is the uh, process that the uh, Windows does as part of the loading process of a PFA, and mapping is simply the translation of physical addresses. So addresses as they are used for files on disk to virtual address ranges in memory. Uh, so you translate address ranges on disk to address ranges in memory. And after that, you can, if you as a reverse engineer make a memory dump of a file in memory, you have to unmap this file so it can be read from tools uh, on disk again so the unmap portion is also on disk and it looks different than the original PE file so but you will see why so the original PE file is like I said before you just have the headers in this example you have two sections and um, the location of the sections is written into the section table also their sizes so uh, it's part of the headers where they are located. Now, if this is loaded into memory, the same section table will also have the translation into the virtual addresses and sizes, and the PE looks quite different than in most cases. Um, for instance, the sections may be much larger than before, especially if, if, uh, if you have a packed file. So a file that has some compressed or packed um, um, data in it, it will unpack this in memory and then it needs more space than before um, to, to contain the same, um, the unpacked stuff. Um, so the sizes may, might be quite different now. And between the sections due to the um, section alignment in memory, might be a lot of unused space which is usually zero bytes and yeah that has to do with paging um 
So those uh, the green ones is the zeros here. Uh, of course, you have also some unused space on this, but wow. Now this is, for example, the translation of these address ranges. So you have the the range for the headers. You have the range for each section, which is translated and then basically written like that into memory. And during execution, uh, more data might be written into the sections. You know, the sections are then larger and might contain more data than before. So um, the PE on this starts at, uh, at offset zero, whereas the PE image in memory starts at the base address. And um, the base address is also written, the preferred base address is written as the image base in the the PE headers. So uh, the section table says the size of headers um, is the size that's also mapped to um, memory, so that's the same. And then for the physical start of each section you have a pointer to raw data for the section on disk and the virtual address um, which corresponds to the same uh, in memory. And uh, the size on this is the size of raw data, and the size of memory is the virtual size. So every time it says virtual, it means it's in memory. Um, yeah, these addresses are relative to the base address, so uh, it means they um, you you would have to add the base address to get the the actual address. So now, if you create a memory dump you suddenly have uh, the same image that was memory, you have it on disk. And the um, pointer to raw data and size of raw data don't fit to what's actually on disk anymore. So you need to adjust those values so that static tools are able to read the PE file properly. Uh, for doing that, you will simply set the pointer to raw data to the virtual address, so both values are then the same. The point data is um, changed to be the the virtual address right now, um, because you know the virtual address is relative to the base address. So it's uh, now you have this memory image, so it's um, the same as the physical offset in the memory dump. Uh, so also you will um, adjust the section sizes so that you are, they are written continuously on disk and um, for doing that you can simply um, calculate the virtual address of section 2 minus virtual address of section 1 for the new size of raw data. So virtual address VA is virtual address uh, section 2 minus section 1. That's the new size of raw data then. I hope this helps you understanding the upcoming portion of uh, OA Labs video. And now, uh, Sergey, please continue with Princess Locker. Thanks, Kristen. That was awesome. So now that we know how PE headers are built, we know that we can just copy a known good one over top of the corrupted one and our PE file should work. The only thing we need to worry about is making sure that the copied PE file aligns correctly with the corrupted one. So we need a reference point to know how much of the header to copy over. So what I've done here is I've pulled up the PE file poster from Korkami, which I will link in the description of the video below. It's a fantastic reference for different magic bytes that exist in a PE file. So here we can see the DOS header and the PE header, which are usually what is corrupted by packers because those have magic bytes in it like MZ and PE and the DOS string, which you can automatically pull out with some automatic unpacking techniques. So that's what they usually like to corrupt. However, they usually will not break up the optional header here because they need that at load time to figure out things like the number of sections, etc., etc. So usually that'll be intact. 
fact. So what we can do is we can use some bytes from the optional header as a reference to match up our good PE header with the corrupted one. So what I like to use is the machine magic bytes because for 32-bit PE files, it's always going to be 14C, which turns out to be 4C01. So these are the bytes we're looking for. So what I like to do is look for 4C01 in the good PE header and 4C01 in the corrupted one. And I know just to copy all the bytes before it. So let's pop back over to our VM and that's what we'll do. So the first thing to do is to open up our corrupted PE and a hex editor here. So here we can see here's the corrupted PE file and I want to look for 4C01. So let's do a search for hex bytes 4C01 because this is a 32-bit PE file. And we can see right here 4C01. So now what we need to do is find a known good PE with a good header and find the same offset and just copy all the bytes before into this PE file. Now so I'm just going to use the original packed PE here because we know that it has a good header because it actually ran when we executed it. So we don't have to find any special PE. We can just go with one that we know works basically. So we're going to use the same trick here and find that 4C01 offset. Find 4C01 and we found it right here. So we can actually just copy all of these bytes from the good PE header into our corrupted one and it should work. There's one extra thing that we need to keep in mind. This PE header that we copy over might actually be smaller or larger than the PE header that we're replacing. And what that's going to do is that's going to misalign our sections. So I'm going to show you how to fix the alignment of the sections last. We don't have to worry about it right now. I'll show you how to do that. And in this case, I think it is a different size. So we will have it misaligned. So you guys will have a good reference of how to fix that. So let's go ahead and copy this bytes over. I'll just control C here. I'll come back over here and I'm going to replace all of these bytes of this garbage before our reference byte here. And it is a different size. So I'm just going to say, okay, I'll deal with it later. At least now we have a good PE header on here that aligns properly. So we'll be able to open this file in some PE tools and do a bit of editing. So at this point, we fix the header. The sections will probably be misaligned, but again, we'll fix that later. So it's not a big deal. So let's save this file and then we'll open it with PE bear and start unmapping it. <laughs> And of course, uh, my Windows VM, I didn't activate the snapshots. Now it's complaining. So we have a black background. <laughs> Anyway, so we're going to save this as new header onto the desktop. Okay, and we don't need the hex editor anymore. So now let's open up PE Bear, my favorite PE fixing tool, and I'll copy this over here. So you see it loaded up fine, which means we fixed the PE header properly. So now let's unmap the file. Basically, when we unmap a dumped file that's mapped, all we're going to do is make the virtual address sections match the raw address sections because, of course, we've dumped a mapped version of the PE file. So the map version now matches exactly the on disk version of the PE file. So there's no longer a difference between the raw address and the virtual address. So all we have to do is make the raw addresses the same as the virtual addresses and all the sections will line up in the file. The other thing we have to do is make sure that the raw size and virtual size align exactly with the difference between the sections. So of course the end of the first section needs to be the beginning of the next section. So first let's fix the raw address to be the same as the virtual address and then we'll fix the size. This is how we do. Okay, so now let's Let's fix the size. So three one and three zeros minus one and three zeros is three and four zeros. 47 and three zeros minus 31 and three zeros is 16 and three zeros. And B minus seven is four and three zeros. And C minus B is one and three zeros. D minus C is one and three zeros. And now we see something interesting. So the relocation table only exists on disk. It's never written to memory. And because we're unmapping the file in this manner, so the unmapped version is identical to the map version, we don't need a relocation table. So what we do now is we actually just set a size of zero for the relocations. So now we have to just copy the sizes over to the virtual size so that they're exactly the same. Okay, so now we have successfully unmapped the file, but we'll notice there's still some red here telling us that there's a problem. Now, this is most likely due to the fact that the sections are misaligned, as I described earlier. So what we need to do now is check the section alignment. And to do that, we need a hex editor. So I'm going to save this file, even though it looks like there's something wrong here. I'm going to save the file, open up the save file in a hex editor, and I'll show you how to fix the section alignment. So we're going to save it on the desktop as new header, new sections. Okay, and we can close this out. So now let's open that save file in a hex editor. 
And actually, we're going to open the file again in PEBear just so we can get the section offsets. So we can see here that the text section should start at one and three zeros hex. So I'm going to show you what that's going to look like visually in a hex editor. So we go to one and three zeros hex, which is right here, one and three zeros. So what we would expect to see is null bytes for the padding right up until one and three zeros hex. And then we should start to see some code in here instead what we see is the code starts up here. So it's misaligned a little bit. Now there's a way to actually calculate this based on the headers. You can do a little bit of math and figure out where it actually should be aligned versus where it is here. But we don't need to do that because we can visually inspect it because we know that in between the header and the section, it's always going to be null bytes. So we should see null bytes right up until the beginning of the section. So the fact that we're seeing a bunch of what looks like code here means that we need to shift this code so that it starts at one and three zeros hex. So all we need to do is insert a few bytes here. So we know that each one of these rows is going to be 16 bytes across. So we need to move it down 16, 32, and then one byte. So 33 bytes. So if we insert 33 null bytes, we should now realign the section so that this E8 starts exactly at one and three zeros hex, which is what we see here. So the text section should start at one and three zeros hex. Now, the reason why I'm using the first section is because the header will always start at the beginning of the PE file. The sections will always start at the beginning of the first section. So the only place where we can add padding is in between the header and the beginning of the first section, which is why I'm looking at only the address of the first section. So that's where we realign sections. If we need to realign them, we realign them by adding or removing space in between the PE header and the beginning of the first section. So that's the only place where we can sort of massage the, where the section starts. So in our hex editor here, we'll just go to edit, insert bytes, and we're going to do decimal, 33 bytes, zero for the hex value. And now E8 starts exactly at one and three zeros hex. So we have realigned the sections. So let's save this, hopefully our final copy, and we'll reopen it at pbear and make sure that there is no more red here because the section will be full of data. So we'll save it as final plot unpacked final exe on the desktop. And let's open that up in pbear and make sure everything looks good. So we come over to the section table here. No more red. Everything looks good. Looks like we realigned it correctly. And another thing to note here in the optional header, you'll see the image base is the same as the base address of the memory section that we dumped out. So remember, we dumped it at four and five zeros. So the base address here is four and five zeros. Now, this has been fixed by the unpacker. So we don't have to do anything about it. Sometimes this base address might not be correct, in which case we will have to change it to be exactly the same as the base address of the memory section that we dumped out. In this case, they've already fixed it, so we're fine. But I did want to point that out in case when you're unpacking something, it's not aligned correctly. So after all that, it looks like we have a fully unpacked Princess Locker payload. But let's open it up in IDA and just make sure and use the IDA Pro free version, new file, PE file. Okay, so loaded up, that took a little while. <laughs> so it looks like our imports are correctly identified here in the P file. We can actually read this, which is the first sign that things are good. We don't see any memory sections that are completely out of the scope of the PE. And it looks like we have some strings here, which is also a good indication that, yeah, I think these are encrypted strings. So it looks like we have completely unpacked this princess locker payload, and now we can get on with analyzing the actual ransomware. So as always, I will link to a copy of this unpacked payload in the description of the video below if you guys want to go ahead and analyze it yourself. And a huge thank you to Carson for coming on and doing a little explanation for us. Again, I will link to his videos below, including his series on PE files, which is fantastic. I highly recommend it. So keep those comments coming. Let us know what you'd like to see us take a look at, send us samples. We do have a list of samples that we are slowly getting to. So stay tuned for that. And remember, if you aren't subscribed to subscribe down below, turn on the little bell for notification, and we'll be trying to keep to one video a week every week. Hopefully we can keep this up. So until next week, keep exposing the mechanics behind the malware and stay curious.